As always, this episode is sponsored by my go-to spot for all things makeup, Revlon. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today we are talking to the trailblazing Iftihaj Muhammad. Iftihaj is a world-class fencer, 2016 Olympic bronze medalist, and five-time senior world champion. Thank you for being on Pretty Big Deal. Of course. Girl, you're so busy. Uh, look, I'm trying to keep up with you. No, you're running to the airport. What are you running to go do? Uh, Austin Book Festival. Ooh. Yeah. Because she's got two books out. Uh, three, girl. What? Right? right? What's the third one? <laughs> First two are memoir, so adult okay. memoir, young adult, and now children's book. Okay, and the yeah. children's book actually is now um, New York Times bestseller, right? It is. Hey. So excited. So you have so many amazing things happening. Aww. And you're an incredible woman. Thank you. You're but so I want to take it back to um, Maplewood, New Jersey. Okay. And throw well, it back. We have to go back to where we started. Right. And these are the situations that shaped us and mold us into who we are as mm -hmm. women today and our experiences that we're able to share with the world. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what it was like to be a black Muslim woman that wore a hijab mm -hmm. going into middle school and high school mm -hmm. and, and what that was like for you. So Maple, New Jersey, very diverse. It's about 30 minutes west of New York City, so not too far from the city. And I've lived there you know, my whole life. Born and, and raised. Born and raised there. And um, one of the cool things about, I guess, our town and like this, this sense of inclusivity that I've always felt is that um, even before I wore hijab, my friends and, you know, my peers, they had seen my mom who's always worn hijab. So even when I started wearing hijab, it, to me, like the bullying could have been worse. Like mm. it was bad, but I believe that bullying is this universal experience that we all share. And I think the toughest moments that I've experienced as a kid who wore hijab came um, in sport. Mm. And having these different, you know, opportunities to travel to, mm -hmm. I don't know, a neighboring school for a competition, whether that be for like volleyball or track or fencing, whatever it was. Sometimes it's the kids from the other school. It's their first, you know, opportunity ever seeing, you know, a woman Summer. who wears hijab or someone who wears hijab or even interacting with, you know, Muslim. Right. And remember, this is all like post 9-11. There's a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes that you're battling, but you're a kid and you're just trying to go out there, you know, and play sports. Talk to me about putting on the hijab too, mm -hmm. because I know that that's, first of all, it's a decision. Right. And second of all, it's about like when you become a woman mm -hmm. and it was, what was your experience like? Did you always know you were going to wear one? So growing up in, you know, a African-American household. My parents are converts. They converted in the 70s. Okay. And pretty religious household. I knew that I was going to have to wear hijab when I hit puberty. Um, and when the time came, my, my mom had prepared me in a way that I would wear hijab to school sometimes. Um, so my teachers were kind of aware, you know, okay. that I wear hijab sometimes, my friends. And so when I started to wear it full time, it just seemed like this kind of seamless event. Like it Got wasn't it. traumatic for me. It wasn't traumatic for my friends. I realized that hijab is something that not every, you know, Muslim woman chooses to observe, but it's always been a really big part of my life. And important. Yeah. To me, uh, my hijab keeps me very grounded in my faith. You know, my mm. faith is so important to me and I feel like it's always been a compass. It reminds me, you know, to be a good person and um, to lead my life with good. So I, I feel really, sh really connected to faith and um, the hijab, like, to me is a piece of that. That's beautiful. Yeah, It thanks. is a good reminder every day. Right? Yeah. I I'm like, so. no, I can't check this person because, you know, <laughs> I got this hijab Because I'm on. literally wearing my face on my sleeve. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so you Your laugh is so cute. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, there's so many laughs. Right? Like, you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> um, you talk about going into sports mm -hmm. and, and traveling and all that, but what drew you to fencing specifically? So played a lot of different sports. Um, and when you think about what the uniform means, right? The mm -hmm. uniform is to take, you know, 
within sport is to take a group of people, you know, you, and it, it unifies them. Mm -hmm. And I was never in uniform in track and field. My teammates wore shorts and tanks and I wore, you know, like spandex capris and, <laughs> you know, like a little t-shirt or even in volleyball, my teammates wore like little hot shorts and tank tops. You were like, what am I wearing? Right. <laughs> I wore sweatpants and like my hijab and I was, I never felt a part of the team in that sense. Mm. And I think that even subconsciously, even though you're not necessarily thinking about it all the time because it's a part of who you are, I think subconsciously there's a, a barrier between mm -hmm. you and like your teammates in a way. So 12 years old, my mom and I are driving past our local high school and my mom sees, you know, athletes in the school cafeteria who are fully covered. They have on pants, white pants, white jackets. They have swords in their hands. And <laughs> she's like, I don't know what that is, but I want you to try it. And that was- All like, because of their outfits. All because it was just uniquely accommodating to my religious beliefs. And she was tired of buying like, you know, long <laughs> sleeves and spandex and stuff underneath uniform. She's like, look, now you can do this. I don't have to buy anything extra. And were you into it? Um, Initially, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird, kind of dorky, kind of white, all things that like, <laughs> I was like not trying to be. But um, when I looked at the top 10 schools in the country, you know, like Harvard, Yale, Duke, Columbia, they all had fencing teams. Interesting. So it was like, oh, well, this is an easy decision. I'll use fencing to go to a college. So that was the original plan. And then did, you went to college? Yeah, I went to Duke. Okay. Yeah, I was recruited to fence at Duke. Okay, yeah. Duke. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but what is the objective of fencing exactly? Because I have no um, idea. So It's I not mean, like, oh, right. on guard. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like modern day sword fighting. So the objective is to like get your opponent before they get you. It's like a, a modern day chess. Oh. or like this physical chess. And so that, it's a lot of mind strategy. Super tactical. Um, I want to outsmart you all the time. That's my plan. So sometimes I have you think that I'm doing one thing and then I do another thing. And it, and I think that's what I love about it is that every single point is so different. And so much of it has to do with um, just being like a step ahead mentally than your opponent. Mm, yeah. Interesting. I just mm. learned how to play chess. So that's why I'm like, ah, ah yeah. yeah. I can't believe at 31 years old, it's now I finally know how to play. But. You're 31? Yes, I'm How old baby. are you? 33. Oh my, oh, you just right? called me a baby? You are a baby. I'm two years young. I'm turning 32 next week. Okay, fine. We're a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but did you have any idea at all that you knew that you were going to be breaking barriers as the first hijabi female to, to be going into this sport specifically mm -hmm. in the way that you did? No, I mean, I from the time I was a kid, thought I was going to medical school. I wanted to be really? a neurosurgeon. Oh yeah, I had no idea that professional sport was in my path. But I always say that, you know, like we plan and then God plans, right? So yes. um, to me, fencing has always been just a vehicle that I've been able to use to kind of change the world in a way. Mm. And I love that sport has been an opportunity for me to be an agent of change mm -hmm. and hopefully provide inspiration to kids out there who, you know, are told no. Like mm. there was a lot of different, you know, stops in my life where I was told I didn't belong. So many obstacles. So many obstacles. Like it's crazy. Uh, today in the news, there's a story about um, a young girl who uh, was disqualified from her track meet in Ohio because she wears hijab. And that story rings so true to me because I remember being in high school and having coaches or officials, you know, try to deter me, my, even my sister, who's a little younger than me, from competing because of our hijab. So it's, it's frustrating, you know, that, that these type of obstacles exist, but that's why these stories are so important. Mm -hmm. That's why these moments are so important because we have to, you know, let our youth know and um, that they can do anything and they can be anything they want. All right, just hold that thought. So since becoming a new mom, I've been thinking a lot about my own mom and how she coped with me and my sisters and everything that she had on her plate. And the one thing that I cannot get out of my head is she did it without online shopping. And honestly, online shopping has made my life so much easier. But you know what's not easy? Finding coupon codes that actually work. I have been burned so many times finding out about a deal after I already bought something. That's why I'm so excited to hear that Honey wanted to sponsor this podcast. Hallelujah. Because I have absolutely loved using it for so long and I've saved so much money. And the other day I actually saved 40 bucks on these diapers. Isaac's not running around yet. Otherwise I'd show you. Here's how it works. 
All you have to do is install it onto your browser for free. And then whenever you're shopping online, which is often if you're me, just hit that apply coupon at checkout and Honey automatically applies the best promo codes to your cart. It literally just scans the entire web for anything available and all the deals and make sure that you get them. Yes. That's it. Honey sponsors over 30,000 stores online and they're adding more every single day. Not using Honey is literally passing up on free money. That's not cool. So it's free to use and installs in just two clicks. So you can get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. That's joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. All right, now let's get back to this conversation. When was it for you specifically that you knew that your talents were far beyond better than just any normal fencer. I don't know if I've ever arrived at that point. I don't even still with a no. with a little bronze medal. Look, from a the little Olympics. bronze medal. That is a big bronze ah! medal, right? <laughs> <laughs> I you know, um I think the sport keeps you humble. And for me, I've always been the hardest working person in the room. That's just a part of who I am. That's like in my DNA. I'm a really hard worker like in the classroom as a student athlete. Uh, this idea that there are people in my life who have told me no, or you know that I don't belong, or there's something I can't do. I get really, you know, like uh, I would say, charged and motivated by this idea of no, because it's mm. like, well, why not? Mm. Like, why don't you think this is something that I can do? And I just like proving people wrong. And so I don't know if there was always this love for fencing, or if that I've believed that I was so good at the sport. It's that it's like, I'm gonna break my back, I'm gonna bust my ass because I need to prove people wrong and show them that this is, this is how successful, you know, an African-American in the sport of fencing can be. This is how successful a Muslim woman in sport can be. Mm. And it's like defying the odds so that, like you said, that crack becomes bigger and more people are able to see themselves in that space and hopefully yeah. be successful. It's so important. Mm -hmm. And your whole talent made this big wave for you. Mm -hmm. Now your exceptional skills have taken you and led you into this moment where you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. What opportunities were brought to the table for you? Uh, through qualifying for the Olympics. Um, there was the Olympics. Right. I mean, I that mean, was major. Well, I mean, it, one of the, the interesting thing, things about sport, especially a small sport like mine, is that nobody's checking for fencing, right, until like the Olympic Games. Like nobody's right. looking for it. And I remember when I qualified and I remember seeing these headlines about like the first hijabi to qualify for Team USA um, to go to the Olympic Games. Which is crazy, right? It, well, to me, it's crazy. Like, why do I have to be the first? Like, I wish there was someone like before me so that it would have been easier for me to see myself in that So you space. didn't like the pressure? Um, not the pressure. I, I, you know, being a first, like, I think we should celebrate first, but I, I it's my hope that you know, it becomes more commonplace. It becomes more normal, you know, for people of color, for minorities to exist in spaces and it not to be like such a shock and like this first right. thing that's happened. Right. Um, but I feel like it, it did kind of change my life in a way. You know, I, I qualified at the height of the presidential election where, you know, there's this proposed Muslim ban. There's a mm. lot of talk about, um, I don't know, like this new bigoted America that has been unearthed. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was my opportunity to use my platform as an athlete, even coming from a smaller sport, um, to show people this new narrative of the Muslim community that within our community we know exists. Mm. But we are literally trying to combat these misconceptions and stereotypes that have existed for far too long, whether that be in Hollywood or media or the things that we consume on a daily basis that we're not even aware of. What happened when you got into the Olympics? I mean, you're the first mm -hmm. African-American, hijab-wearing Muslim mm -hmm. woman who's coming into a sport that people, I mean, they probably don't speak about as, like you said, commonly as maybe, you know, gymnastics or ice skating. Or like basketball. Basketball, well, yeah, right. all those things. Mm -hmm. But now here you are, you're the first. Mm -hmm. What came with that? I mean, there's two ways you can think about it. You can think of it as pressure, you can think of it as opportunity. And for me, I've always thought of qualifying for the Olympic team as a gift. Mm. I know tons of people who, we're on the exact same journey of, you know, uh, trying to make it in sport, trying to qualify for an Olympic team and, you know, just falling short and didn't go to the Olympics. So mm. I've always seen it as a gift. And um, mm. even having the Olympic medal to me is just like, I did not see that coming. I feel so thankful. I'm like, thank you, God, for that medal. I <laughs> didn't know I needed it, but I appreciate it. But 
I can imagine like even getting that medal and like you said in 2016, like here we are and the presidential election is coming up and there's so many things that are after people that are minorities. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like representing Team USA mm -hmm. and then having to combat all of that as well? I feel really strongly about not allowing bigots in this moment to take away our identity. Mm. I'm African-American. I don't have another country to claim. My ancestors were forcefully bought here, you know, 400 years ago and literally built this country on their back. So for me, America is home and I'm not going to allow anyone to take that identity from me. So representing the United States was the greatest honor of my life, you know, competing at the Olympics. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't uh, speak out against the issues of social injustice that we're facing in that moment. Right. So I used every opportunity, whether that be media or even on my own social channels to speak out against the things that I saw that were occurring. And even though it wasn't super popular to do, especially at the Olympic games, I felt like I can't expect, you know, these other 300, 400 other athletes to do it. And you can't rely on other people. You, we all have to step up in our own individual way. However, or whatever that looks like, you have to figure it out. In my opinion, you have to be conscious and think about things in a way like, if it's happening to someone, when will it happen to me? When, mm. when will my people be up next? Mm. So it's like, we have to show up for one another. We have to support one another and we have to be agents of change. Agents of change. Yeah. You have this awesome quote, mm -hmm. says, never allow fear to override your commitment to faith. Mm -hmm. And I know faith is important to you, but I want you to talk about what that quote means. Um, I mean, if you let fear uh, overwhelm you, um, I think it can be debilitating. Mm. And I've had moments in my life uh, that I talk about in my memoir, Proud, mm -hmm. of being fearful and having anxiety and suffering from depression and how, for me, those, those feelings and those sentiments manifested themselves physically where I wasn't able to compete. And taking control of that fear and like harnessing it in a way that allowed me to show up strong and show up strong every day, even if that meant, you know, I didn't feel 100%, I think is so meaningful. And faith to me, like, no matter if I am afraid or, you know, if I am feeling a little anxious before I compete or I'm afraid to maybe, you know, send out this tweet or I don't know what the repercussions or backlash will be, I have to have faith that the decision that I'm making is the right decision. I have mm. to have faith that, you know, God is going to, you know, support me and be there even even in those difficult times. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing to have such strong faith to be able to just take you through whatever. I have that too, being mm -hmm. a Christian woman. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that when you meet another person that's so faith-based in what they believe, like there's nothing that can come across or it can break that bond mm -hmm. and that exterior. Um, I, I just think it's awesome because I yeah. see myself in that yeah. comment. I mean, I think that when I think of faith, especially the Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, mm -hmm. I think that they're more alike than they are different. And that's why I feel like you may feel connected to what I'm saying. But I think that whether it be in, you know, your connection to God or your happiness or whatever it is, I think that life moves in ebbs and flows. Yes. And I think that especially as like public figures, I think that there's this misconception that you're always strong or that you're never sad or you don't have like, you know, divots in your strength or um, your happiness. And it's not true. I feel like it's so important for us to be open about you know, things that we've experienced or how we feel or how we get over it. And it to is. me, it's like, for me, it's faith. Like my faith is what keeps me so grounded and rooted and um, helps me get through even like really difficult moments. I know I talk about meditating and praying every morning and just having mm -hmm. that like peace and that calm. Mm -hmm. It's very important. This conversation is so great, but just give me two seconds. If you know me, you know I'm all about that self care. And one of my new favorite self-care routines is all about scents. Vitruvi is a family company committed to creating chic essential oil products that help women take care of themselves so they can take care of the world. Vitruvi aromas are made from 100% pure plant-based essential oils, making this safe for you and your family to breathe in on a daily basis. And it can help you set the mood, whether you need a moment of calm, a deep sleep or a boost of energy. Head to vitruvi.com slash pretty big deal for a look at special offers and get 20% off with code PBD. All right, now back to pretty big deal.
You talk about getting death threats mm -hmm. and just threats in general, being in uh, the Olympics and being who you are, period. Mm -hmm. How did the U.S. Fencing Association deal with that? Um, and the no. Olympic Association, I guess, yeah. as well. Uh, USA Fencing didn't deal with it very well. I think that they mishandled a lot of the death threats that I received. I felt like they should have protected me in those moments as an athlete who's preparing for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to email me to tell me that like Johnny in Colorado, you know, wants to kill me. I don't need that. Why would they tell you that? Uh, bizarre, I don't know. I still- They wanted you to fail? Um, Maybe they're just not uh, qualified for the job positions Got that it. they're in. I'm <laughs> not really sure, like who knows? Wow. I don't want to uh, pass judgment on decisions that they've made. I'm not sure why the things happened the way that they did, but I feel like there was their efforts to protect maybe my teammates more so than they were to protect me. Mm. And that can be frustrating because mm. you do start to wonder like, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm Muslim? Like, what's the problem? Seriously. You know, because I don't think you would have done that to this person or this person, but you seem to, you know, want to throw me off my game a little bit. I don't know, very conscious effort to try to ignore them. <laughs> like, it's like, you are a distraction and let me ignore you. And to be honest, having a great management team yeah. to just help kind of, you know, curb USA fencing all the time and serve as a barrier of protection to kind of keep me focused and myopic on my goal of, of competing well at the Olympics. Man. Yeah. But that's, you got through it. You got the bronze, 2016. Look, I mean, <laughs> I, to be honest, it's one of those things that it's hard to believe because I was competing under such difficult conditions. You know, I had, national coach was very clear that he didn't want me competing and mm. didn't want me a part of Team USA. I had teammates who, um, like fencing is a very contentious sport in a way that it's individual first. Mm. So if three people get to go to the Olympics and you have like a bunch of people who are like, oof, I wish I could qualify above her, you know, um, it just creates a very contentious space. So it's not a friendly space to exist in. There's a lot of jealousy and envy that exists. And, Qualifying for the Olympics and having a, a ton of uh, media attention did not help, you know, the, the the relationships with teammates at all. It just made it more difficult. And I'm sure as you succeeded, it probably made it even more difficult. I mean, I think right now it's kind of funny. Like, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, did you see that? I hope you did. Because yes, Hello. that happened, right? <laughs> like, I would flip my hijab, but I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep but it But you cute. look cute right oh, now. thank you. <laughs> um, we got to do something really fun together. Yes. We got um, to have Barbies. We sure did. So That's my true claim to fame. Uh, what, I they love have a Barbie? Her. Oh, my God, I love yes. her. Right? So it's the Shiro collection. Mm -hmm. And when they called you and said, hey, we want to do a Barbie in your likeness, and we want her to have a hijab on. What was your first reaction? So excited because yeah. for me, it's just like this totally makes sense. And as a kid, I was the queen of Barbie. Like, really? Oh, I love Barbie dolls. And I heard that your dad suggested that you always uh, play with black Barbies. Both my parents. So okay. my mom is the one who would, like take a shop and get the dolls. Okay. My mom's like, nope. You have to have a brown doll. Okay. Like, so I've never had a white doll in my life. Oh wow! Not a baby doll. Not a Barbie doll. I've only had brown dolls. And then they want to make a Barbie in your likeness. Right. What was the process like for you? For me, I had to say, like, she has to have thick thighs. Love that. I wanted her to have cellulite, but it was just a little bit complicated. <laughs> <laughs> what were your, what did you say you needed? Um, so I remember when your doll came out and I loved that she was size inclusive. And so when it was time for me to help them, you know, like, uh, or me to voice like what I wanted my doll to have, having strong legs mm. like to me these legs help me help carry me to the olympics help yes. me win a medal at the olympics i'm like she has to have strong legs this is a part of my identity not only as a woman but also as an athlete mm -hmm. um i wanted her to have really strong eyeliner mm -hmm. and like perfect eyebrows but also did she have light eyes like yours she did you know yeah. what they like nailed it they did such a good job <laughs> i really i loved it and i remember sitting like at the Mattel like warehouse or whatever and they told me that my doll would be for sale. I cried like oh. ugly tears. I was just so excited oh. because I I remember being a kid and going to the toy store and yeah. like there's no brown dolls on the shelf so I can't have one and that I don't know it just means a lot to me that not only do kids get to shop for this doll that chooses to wear hijab but 
Um, they also have the opportunity to have a fencing doll. I just think it's kind of cool. I know. Have you heard of stories of young girls now that are wanting to fence because of your doll? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always interesting to me when we see little boys who have the Barbie because it's an oh. action figure for them, you know? Oh, I didn't even think yeah. of that. Oh, I, to cool. me, that's the, like one of the most endearing things is to see little boys who have the Barbie who like won't let her go, who like <laughs> always have her, their sword with them. Yeah, it's cute. And now you have a deal with Nike. I do. Holy moly. Right? I mean, did you see this coming? Do you have on Nikes? Uh, we'll pretend they're Nikes. These are Adidas. <laughs> no, actually, these are Al Alexander McQueen. I was going to say, they look like Nike. <laughs> we'll just claim them. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? I, I mean, for me to see representation that so many different um, of these big athletic brands are doing finally, like to see like a curvy girl, mm -hmm. it's like, finally, what does it feel like the for you? The curvy mannequins. I Don't know. you live for them? Yes. I'm like, you know what? It's about time. It is. And that's how I feel when it comes to the hijab. Like, as an athlete who's been competing in professional work for a long time, my hijab was a hindrance for me, and I didn't even know mm. until I wore the Nike hijab. The Nike hijab is thinner, and when I compete, for the first time, I could hear. And I didn't realize I spent my entire career being carded for false starting, not being ready. Referees think that, you know, you're just... Um, you're trying to delay the start of the match, but really it's like, no, did you did you tell us the fence? I can't hear you. That is wild. Yeah, so the material I fence in is called Georgette, and it was, um, when it gets wet, it gets so thick that you can't hear through it. And I had no idea until the Nike Pro Hijab. That is yeah. very interesting. Yeah. And talking about clothes, now you have a clothing line called Luella. I do. And you started the business with your sister? Mm-hmm. So my sisters and my brother. Oh, sisters. Yes, yeah, sisters. Brother. There's a bunch of us. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Tell us about it. So we started the company a few years ago. It's been about five years now. And it started out of necessity. There mm -hmm. was no one making um, fashionable, modest clothes in the U.S. And it's such a profitable uh, uh, like space. My gosh, yeah. it's crazy. Right. I mean, and my thing was, yes, I could find modest clothes, but were they fashionable? I didn't think so. Right. So my sisters and my brother and I, we want to not only make clothes in this like fashionable, modest way, but we also want to be um, conscious about the way we made them. Mm -hmm. So we work with female manufacturers in Los Angeles and New York who employ women. And um, it's an opportunity for people to, you know, express themselves through what they wear, but also, um, you know, in some way, uh, be helping their communities at the That's same cool. time. Yeah. Do you have hijab swimsuits? No, we don't do that. Okay. <laughs> There's a bunch of clauses as a Nike athlete. You can't oh, do that. right, because you contracted. Right. I know. I've been talking to swimsuits for all the company I work with about making a hijab uh, mm -hmm. swimsuit, just mm -hmm. like because I think it's important. Oh, I agree. I have another friend who says like I see myself wearing the same one that everybody else is wearing. It's like. There's just not enough. No, we all wear the same yes. one. There's like two companies. We all wear the same one. They're cute Shoot. though. Yeah. We all wear the same ones. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like we make more, like this cardigan is from my line. Yes. Um, we make Fire. More, I'm going to send you one. That's Please. done and done. Oh, anything leopard? I I'm got here you. for it. I know. I, I thought you were going to wear leopard today. I thought we were going to twin it. Uh, no, I had a blue dress on, but the bra was like, it was because uh, everything's growing. Uh, so I don't know what size I am. Baby's like, I'm here. Mm. I'm out. <laughs> um, okay. Also, you have three books out right now. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody what they are. So my memoir, Proud, My Fight for an Unlikely American Dream, also comes in a uh, young reader's edition, so like middle school. Um, and then I have a children's book, uh, The Proudest Blue, a story of uh, hijab and family that came out a few weeks ago. So great. I Thank can't you. wait to read that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially for the little, with the little bambino. one coming. I know. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here. I really Thank appreciate it. I know you got a flight me. to catch, but one more thing that we do on Pretty Big Deal yes. is we do a lightning round called Live Boldly Lightning Round. Okay. I'm and you excited. just have to answer these questions. Okay. Okay. All right. What's the last pretty penny you spent? The last pretty penny? Huh. <laughs> I bought myself some diamonds. Yeah, I was like, oh, I was like, why would you wait for a man when you can buy yourself? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Thank you. What's the biggest deal breaker for you? Biggest deal breaker in terms of anything. Anything. Man, business, friends. Yeah, I think trust. I'm really big on just people being honest, mm -hmm. and I really struggle when someone like you know is not not truthful mm. um, because then I feel like where does the relationship go from there? I can't trust you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I would say trust for That's sure. That's been a popular one. Yeah. Um, and since you're a pretty big deal, uh, I want to know what's a pretty big deal to you. I would say to use my platform in meaningful ways. I mm. think that we all have a platform, some of us smaller than others, uh, and we 
owe it not just to our communities, but to ourselves to be agents of change all the time. Agents of change. Yeah. She said it a couple of times, folks. I hope you hope you heard it. Right. Empty <laughs> Hodge, thank you so much for being here. Thanks I really too. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Don't forget to join the conversation on social. Follow Pretty Big Deal on Instagram and Twitter. And send us all your questions and comments. We want to hear from you. 